So here we go. So hello, Asher, welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming on. So we are brand new to each other. I love it when this happens. Um, let's start wherever you want to start. What's what brings you here today? What got you interested in music? Wherever you want to mm. begin. What got me into music? Uh, well, my mother got me into music at the age of two and change uh, on a box violin, margarine box about this size, and uh, it's made of rubber bands uh, serving as strings. So I plucked them and uh, that's how I learned. And she made that for you. Yeah, I don't know if it was like a Suzuki method, like a typical thing in Japan where the Suzuki methods began. Uh, and you know, essentially you start kids off really young and you know they don't know their head from their toe. So that's the way to start them off uh, with, with a classical instrument. And uh, then I moved to like a little you know, just I moved my way up each year as I grew a very tiny um, acoustic classical violin about this size. And then uh, and I, I just uh, moved through the books until I kind of broke free of the uh, I'm going to say I probably 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 I don't know, did like got up to book 15 or something. I don't remember exactly. And then I was like, enough is enough. Huh? This is like all self-taught or did you have a teacher no, at some point? No, I had, form, I had, yeah, it's called formal. I mean, I had formal private training uh, pretty much my whole life up until age 19. Oh, wow. And, um, and uh, yeah, I would say the last teacher I had once I was in high school and I was like fully developed and mature, or at least more developed and mature, um, that was probably the longest stretch that I had uh, a teacher. His name is Tom Halpin. Graduate Juilliard happened to be a classmate of my aunt, who's uh, in the Boston Symphony, Sheila Fikowski, uh, Fikowski and uh, it's a funny coincidence. And yeah, he, he probably was one of the best teachers that I had uh, among the many that I went through throughout the years. So your aunt is a musician and your mom was as well, or was she just interested in you being a musician? Yeah, um, well, music was pretty intense throughout the family. So every one of my three other siblings played played an instrument. My mother played uh, ukulele, father played violin. Um, my parents weren't weren't trained the way they trained us. They trained us all from very young ages, probably me the youngest, I don't know why. Um, my mother claims that I, I looked at my older brother, uh, looked up to my older, older brother and asked for the instrument because you know he was six years older he was playing concertos so i thought hey i want that too what was he playing on uh oh what concertos or what instrument no no yeah like was he also a violinist yeah my oldest brother uh errol um he played yeah he played acoustic classical and um he was really really good uh and it's a little sad, you know, he gave it up. I'm the only professional musician in the family, uh, not necessarily the best. I mean, I guess now that I've been playing for decades, uh, possibly, but but they, they they really, they all could have made, they could have made it a career, all of them. Um, my older brother is an oboist. He was, in the, the, he was the first oboist in a number of symphonies uh, and orchestras even throughout college uh, at, at University of Pennsylvania and yeah, I mean, I could, I could blather on about that forever. <laughs> that's really cool. You come yeah. from a very musical family. Like yeah, really and cool. what's funny about this um, is that I, there was never an intention by my parents for any of us to make this a career. It was really just like an extracurricular enrichment okay. type of thing, the way we did played soccer and uh, did track, tennis throughout our childhood. This is like childhood. the well-rounding of their... Yeah, and actually, cultural education. Was that like the a well-rounded cultural education, including sports and music and language and yeah, yeah, everything. I was I was pretty privileged. Um, I, you know, in this day and age, where like the people are like generally proud to come from a lack of privilege and then gain <laughs> something and become something. I, I, I um, I'm gonna be really frank. I, I was given. Uh, a pretty, I, I was given a lot on a silver platter. I mean, I, I, I didn't grow up wealthy, but I grew up cultured, if that's the word, yeah. you know, middle class. 
And, um, but, but what, but to my credit, I am extremely, I'm self-aware and I am extremely grateful uh, for that upbringing. And I don't take that for granted now in retrospect. So I just want to make that point. It's, in, it's interesting. I, I, I deal with a, a level of that too, like that there, there were definitely struggles as I'm sure you've experienced struggles in your life too, but like in terms of, yeah, in terms of access to the finer things such as, you know, music, museums, you know, uh, travel, things like that. I definitely feel where you're coming from, but it's interesting yeah. that we feel the need to be kind of like shameful about that because I feel like, <laughs> no, I mean, don't you think like if somebody doesn't have that, they would like be almost, I feel like they would be almost upset with us for being like sad. You know, it's like, you have this, enjoy right. it. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. I, I sometimes feel the guilt because I, I hear it on the news and the media all the time. And uh, I see like so many successful people who tell that story of, you know, I, I grew up in an under-resourced neighborhood, uh, broken family, yeah. mom did crack, dad wasn't around committed suicide and I became the president of this organization <laughs> uh, and I don't have that exciting story but right. that being said um oddly enough I did have a, a pretty challenging um num stretch of, of quite a few years uh yeah. in other capacities not because of necessarily lack of resources but uh because, because of health issues yes oh right yeah I remember so we can talk about that if you'd like. But, sure. yeah, yeah, I'm an, I'm an open book. I got nothing to hide. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, um, I, I generally, um, I find it to be therapeutic to share it with the public. Um, whereas I guess a lot of people are very private about their shortcomings or their issues. Um, so yeah. So if you want to talk about that, basically I, um, I had throughout my, throughout, um, I would say my youth, uh, I'm, I'm going to say around starting in high school, I started to feel like a weakness in my arm and uh, it was generalized weakness, uh, but especially in the extremities. And uh, because I worked, I played violin so intensely for so many years in orchestras and so forth, uh, became, I became weaker and weaker uh, over the years. And it, it was pretty scary. And um, nobody had an explanation for me, uh, which made me, first of all, frustrated, but also a bit cynical. And even cynical, more, more so cynical um, later on as I kind of grew older um, about, about the fact that we live in such a, a wealthy country and yet information and disinformation and lack of proper support, um, it, it, it's a problem. Um, at least that's been my personal experience, it isn't for, for a lot of other people, but for me, that's sort of led me to to, I don't know, to become a bit of a cynical person, but I try, I try to fight that. Um, so in a nutshell, I, I basically ended up in a wheelchair um, about seven, eight years ago for many, many uh -huh. months because I de developed adrenal insufficiency. And again, it's not like I hadn't been to the doctors, uh, like I hadn't had blood tests every year of my life. Um, there was no guidance. There was no like preventative, like, hey, this is happening. It was like after the fact, or once I like started to lose strength in my mm. arm and my, and my back, this, this, um, started to happen. And it could have been, you know, that these, these health issues, probably the reason why I went to get a degree in, in, in nursing, um, oh. at NYU and I have three other degrees in the sciences, um, all this useless information in my head. Uh, <laughs> that I don't practice them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you, no, you can finish your sentence. Sorry. I, I didn't mean to. No, I just said that I, I, I just, I, I, I focus 100% on my effort now on on violin. I try to run yeah. one race, which is challenge, challenging enough as it is. Sorry, being a producer, violinist, like there's a lot of aspects to the violin, to being a musician, live performer, producer, composer, uh, but that's like kind of my branding as a violinist. Right. right. No, I, I can really also relate to what you're saying about the medical system, basically. I mean, it's very frustrating when you have an illness that they basically can't do anything for or they haven't done enough for or they haven't done anything for you to prevent the acceleration of of whatever i, I had a, a thyroid 
um, issue that you know, when I was in uh, after college. You're not alone. You are yeah. in very good company. Let me just say, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and and it and that was like that was the in first country, time. Buddy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but that was the first time in my life where I was like, you can't do anything for me. Right. You I don't just know. Take this you pill for the rest of my life. Like that's your answer, really? And it yeah. totally it like to because I guess before that I assumed that like medicine's purpose was curing illness or you know to help people overcome you know as opposed to just like this is the situation yeah this. yeah like this is like we are now your you know your your drug peddlers for for the next 80 years of your life which it's very disappointing and i guess for some people that's satisfying because it's like okay at least i can do something about it and you know then we're over with but i was not a satisfactory answer for me so anyway i, I can I definitely did not end up in a wheelchair, so it did not take me to that extreme. And I imagine that that was very scary. Yeah, I wouldn't have shared what I shared today if I hadn't <laughs> ended up ended up almost like dead <laughs> or having lost my family. I would have wow. no, been like, okay, this happened, and I had back pain, <laughs> and I'm good, you know. But like, I, I almost lost everything, and it's like, and I started to think about the system around me, and like, okay, who's at fault? Like, how much of this is my fault? I really tried to be healthy. I tried, like my parents did everything they could, like they loved me, cared for me, like they did everything they could. Is this really all just like genetic? <laughs> but here I am standing in front of you, healthy. I dance my ass off on stage. Um, you know, there's obviously ge genetic components to everything, yeah. but um, I think there's a little more than that. So what did you do? So I, I just, so I'm happy to, I'll, I'll, I'll answer that. I just want to, <laughs> um, I don't want your listeners to, to feel like I am representing anything or selling anything because that's not my intention i'm a musician yeah. i'm not a practicing practitioner although sometimes i feel like i should be um <laughs> with my experiences but uh what i did in a nutshell and i probably should write a book about this um i did a lot of my own research and uh, i i went to some pretty expensive um out of network physician physicians um and and I, I I was on a permanent dosage of Cortef, um, you know, according to, according to the doctors. I was also going to like the you know my primary care just to get checked up to get multiple like um, what's the word uh, perspectives on on the issue to try to get to the bottom of it. Um, didn't get any info from again the like the the primary care or when I went to the ER or any of that stuff. Um, but I got. And I honestly, I didn't even get full information from the very expensive um, practitioners. They just kind of gave me better options. Mm -hmm. And I'm being purposely vague here because I don't want to specify any brands or like what I did. Sure, sure. Um, so uh, what's the word? Yeah, so, but, but in general, um, I found that nutritional imbalance was one, not not to be confused with a lack of eating because i'm i've always been a big eater and and a healthy eater eater um but and i always ate whole foods and all that stuff that that you know uh nutritionists recommend but i i for my body type i had an imbalanced type of nutritional situation that required like a lot of intervention mm -hmm. um and uh, is you know different allergies and re reactivities to different types of things which i now now that I'm, you know, it's taken me about eight years to get into the groove because I can't take any chances with my gigs. Um, I, I, I'm keenly aware of my body. I listen to my body in a way that I was never taught to. And, uh, you know, when something flares up or I feel something or I, I react to something, I'm aware. I'm like, I, I, I know what I just had or was exposed to and I, and I stay far away from it because uh, I have an inflammatory uh, condition, uh, which was diagnosed like six years prior to ending up in a wheelchair, but nothing was done about it. Right. <clears throat> I know it was like an earlode there. Yeah, no, no, that- Feel free to ask questions, yeah. That makes, that makes a lot of sense. So, and I feel like inflammation was not something that was, be, was it being discussed with you and when this first happened? Because that wasn't, I mean, I remember like it was only my second doctor that actually mentioned inflammation when it came to the thyroid and what certain foods might influence that. Or... 
Yeah. So um, the inflammation was mentioned way down the road. Like by the time I was maybe a junior in college and, and I started to like, like I, I was working my way. I was doing, I was gigging my way throughout college, like mm. every week, sometimes a couple of times a week. And the fact that I couldn't lift the instrument up was concerning to me. And, um, and this I is before you're in the wheelchair. This is before. That was before. Yeah. So like, I don't know, I think it was 2014. I was in the wheelchair. So maybe we're talking like between 20, 2002 to 2010 or so, you know, everything was just sort of a okay. Uh, and I was kind of functional. So, so essentially, um, I'm going to say, I don't know, 2006, maybe, uh, I, I was, uh, you know, I went to, I was referred to a neurologist who, who checked my like neurological function, like in my legs, mostly my legs. And they just said, oh yeah, you have this inflammatory condition and let me go. <laughs> and then like the in-house doctors were like, okay, here's some NSAIDs, take, take the NSAIDs, reduce your inflammation, maybe nauseous as hell. And I was like, I, I, I'd rather go to physical therapy, but that's all they had. NSAIDs. Yeah. And, anti-inflammatories that's what that's that's like a medication that reduces your inflammation that... yeah non-steroidal uh, anti-inflammatory um you know basically a prescription what do you um, think that is i mean having gone through nursing school like is it not obvious to the medical community that there is a dietary component to our health like, do they just expect very little from their patients? What's going on there, do you think? Um, well, uh, some of them expect very little. Uh, I know my mother, she had breast cancer and, and she was surprised when I was giving her all this advice, just based on things like, hey, have, has your doctor checked your vitamin D levels? Yeah. Uh, you know, are they like 30 or are they like 15? Because if you don't have an immune system to fight off the cancer, which we deal with in our daily lives, then you have no prayer. Same thing with COVID and other, other conditions right, like right. constantly. So, um, so in that case, the, the, the doctor responded to her, she, he's like, are you uh, like, is your son uh, like a nurse or something? Like she was, she immediately like knew that I, I had been, that I knew about this stuff and that yeah. I was informing her and she was livid. So some of those firsthand She was stories, angry. Yeah. She was angry. She was like, you're my primary care. Where the hell have you been for the last time? Oh, your or, mother was angry. I thought you were saying the doctor was. I'm like, <laughs> no, no, no. yeah, sorry. I, I'm like, I'm talking really fast here. Um, no, I, my, I just, my mother was upset because she gotcha, felt like, yeah, I depend on you. I trust you. You're the authority. Why aren't you looking into like my diet or my nutrition, you know, right. my nutritional health and stuff like that. Um, uh, physicians, you know, they spend maybe like, a. Yeah, I think they take like one course in nutrition. My uncle's a physician. Um, right. They should maybe take more, but but the way the medical system's set up, uh, and I guess nurses take about that also, maybe a little more. Uh, I'm trying to remember the courses I took. We took, we didn't take a whole lot. We took more like yeah. pharmacology. Right. Well, I'm not even saying that they should become nutritionists, but I mean, no. that what does it it's take like 30 seconds to say you might want to go see a nutritionist or like you might want to read yeah. up on you know, this vitamin. Referrals to nutrition. Yeah. Nutrition. Yeah. I think so. It's interesting. Yeah. But that, that, it doesn't occur to a lot of them. That's not like the first, I, yeah. none of these positions are like ill intention, but it's the system yeah. that's set up. I mean, my uncle has been complaining about the system for years and like, yeah. he, he's a, he's a hardworking physician who wants the best for his patients, but he's limited by insurance. And anyway, I, I don't want to like, yeah, talk no, no, I, about medicine, I, 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 I totally, yeah. I, I actually, I remember my friend, just recently wrote a post about this because she's um, a nurse. No, sorry, she is a and she's a, a physician. She's primary care. She's pediatrics, mm -hmm. and she just gets so frustrated because she wants to be able to do so much more, but she can't. Right, and, and actually, just because you brought it up, um, my my ten year old. Actually, I also have a two year old. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we want the best doctor in in house. You know, network. Uh, possible and we looked all over long island couldn't find anybody who did basic tests no. like they would prescribe uh whatever certain meds without doing the basic tests we have there's one doctor um up in westchester we drive like you know uh 
45 minutes out of our way each way just to go to her because <laughs> she she goes out of her way to to like just kind of fight the system mm, that's really cool yeah but it's sad that that it's that hard to find people like that yeah so you you eventually did figure this out for yourself, I guess, or from some combination of like little breadcrumbs people had <laughs> had left. Out of, out of sheer desperation. Yeah. I didn't have any choice. Like I was yeah. literally a, a I, I was uh, I was just in lying in bed. I couldn't get up. Yeah. Well, I mean, you did have a choice. You could have succumbed to your condition and went, I guess this is what this is gonna be like forever, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, but I, I don't know if I'll, I feel like a, a lot of people might have just kind of not been able to like, get out of it. Yeah, that's what it I was mean, that yeah. hard. Like, I, yeah. it was, yeah, it was tough. Yeah. So what was your first kind of aha moment or like perspective change that made you believe that it was possible for you to overcome this? Um. I just uh, because I, I well actually I, I I started to read um, some various textbooks. You know I had like my brother bring me some textbooks from the library, uh, and I started to find some some uh, really fascinating sites um, online that that I found to be very helpful um, and with with people with similar symptoms to me, and I was so relieved when I found that, mm. uh, and I was so relieved like when I saw that. The solution wasn't so difficult, but this was after just literally hours and hours and hours of just desperately trying to find something. Yeah, and that's kind of what got me out out of out of the woods. Do you feel like because you do you feel like you were kind of leaning on your passion for this instrument? Like, did that in any way help you conceive of hope or like a reality that was? Um, oh, because I had such a passion for the instrument. Yeah. Like, did that make you want to live more? Do you think, or make you want to be able to use your I'm arms more? I was motivated. I hope I answered your question here. Uh, I, I was motivated from every aspect of my life. Um, yeah. I just didn't have the physical capacity. Um, and that was the most stressful thing is like, I was telling my wife, like, I can't get up. Like I'm trying to get up. I physically can't do it. Yeah. Um, I don't have the strength. Um, I just like, I would just sleep for hours and hours and hours. I mean, that's, that's part of adrenal insufficiency yeah. just days upon days. And it was scary as hell. And I just, um, and, um, so, but, but I saw how distressed she was and she was really just, uh, it was really obviously affecting her. Cause it's like, how, how do you, how do I take her, my son? And then, you know, my husband's like, let just, just deteriorating. Yeah. Um, so, so, so like the worst part of this happened while you were married and had a baby. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. It was, it was just, it was, it was horrendous. I, I, I can't even explain how bad it was. I was in tears when I got, when I finally, like I got up and I had the strength to lift my violin. I mean, I missed my instrument. Yeah. I missed my career. And I, I mean, I had given it up. I, uh, the previous few years, which is why I went to other under other careers, I guess I because I, I didn't have the strength. So I thought, okay, well, I have the brain power, so I'll you know go you know get a nursing degree, uh, oh, talk okay. to DOE for four years. So um, it wasn't even like out of a desire to cure yourself necessarily. It was just sort of like a plan B career wise, or was it kind of both? Um, it sounds really disingenuous. Like I really didn't want to become a nurse. I I, I did because I I have a fascination, obviously just from my own experiences in, in, in medicine and treatments and, and uh, treating conditions and helping people because just, just for, again, because of my own experiences. And also just cause I had a pretty extensive medical and, and bio, bio, bio biology background, mm. my bachelor's and my master's from NYU and so forth. Yeah. I have to plug my computer in, hold on a second. I plugged your phone in the beginning. That was smart. There we go. But actually, um, if I, I if I had not collapsed, um, I might be practicing medicine right now. I mm. might not have, have picked up the violin. I, I think it was like this mm. sort of like awakening that wow, life is really really short, and I almost like died early. 
um, or I, I, you know, I almost like just lost my ability to be a functional human being and uh, give me a different perspective and made me feel like, I, you know, I'll take the, I'll take my chances uh, with music, even though it's <laughs> a much less, it's a, it's a much riskier career, much riskier, um, much more challenging to like uh, work your way to the top and, uh, and like, it's not a stable nine to five type of job. It's not a predictable pattern. You, right. you're, you're, it's a lot of entrepreneurship elements to it. It's not an in-demand job. Great. But... <laughs> yeah, that is true. I always feel like, I mean, in a sense it is, I suppose, like somewhere there is someone demanding just what you have, right? They're like, they're seeking exactly what you have to offer. But yeah, definitely like the finding of that is not a straightforward thing, which you find out when you apply for jobs out of college, I suppose. And you're like, like what is the path to music producer? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a lot of there's a lot of courses that claim to give you that path. Yeah. And um, I don't think so. I, yeah. I, I'm pretty disappointed with with a good number of them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because it has so much to do with the people that you encounter and the, yeah. you know, the connections that you make and, yeah. and there's, there's like nothing wrong with that. I get it. But it's so, it's so, um, it's so much more fluid than, than like, okay, I know if I work at this desk job for the next 10 years, I will be promoted to this position. And then yes. I know that if I, yeah. If I don't, yeah, if I don't kill anybody in the process. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But then like, you know, I don't know if you've ever seen that Jim Carrey speech that he gives to his alma mater where he's like, awesome. he decided to become a, an actor because after watching his, I believe it was his dad was an accountant, but something like super stable. Right. And uh, his dad, after like, whatever it was, 50 years at his career was fired and he had nothing. And he realized that day he was like, everything has, everything is risky. You could fail at anything. <laughs> Jim Carrey's like a fascinating character, <laughs> isn't he? Like, he's really fascinating. Movie. Totally. Yeah. He had like a, he had a, he had an awakening. I mean, he had a yeah. real traumatic experience with I think the loss of his his girlfriend. Oh no, into, I don't know about that. Jim Carrey. Oh yeah, that's yeah. that's why he kind of went off the deep end. According, I mean, he really like oh, kind of yeah. lost it. He became really, really, really cynical. Um, and he kind of like like his his like the death of his girlfriend or like yeah i think his girlfriend like overdosed on on medication or something oh. like that which is like the story of hollywood totally yeah not just hollywood but for, you know because that that stuff's publicized a lot yeah oh interesting i didn't know that i mean yeah. that makes sense though yeah what other reason would you have for having a spiritual awakening <laughs> I mean, yeah, you, you need like a traumatic experience. Otherwise, yeah. it's like, okay, it ain't broke. It, if it ain't broke, don't fix it kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and it wasn't broke, broken for him until something like that happened because he was flying high for most right. of his life. Right. But, yeah. Yeah. One of the other things I love about that speech is he says, I wish everybody could experience what it's like to have all the money in the world and still feel empty. <laughs> I love that quote. I mean, he's just, yeah. I get that people, I get that like, it's hard to know if people have beef with him or if the media has beef with him. Like, cause the media yeah. has a narrative, but um, whatever. Beef, I, have, I don't even know that really. They have beef with him. Yeah. He's been made fun of just, um, well, I guess cause he got hyper political on his Twitter and well, yeah, oh. I've, I've seen his posts on Twitter and it's like, I don't like to get, I don't like to like delve recently. Into, uh, yeah. In the last year or two when he's oh. just started like trashing music industry and uh, the, the cinema industry, like what the movie industry, uh, which oh. again, he, he had been at the top of his, you know, he's a legend, right? Uh, comedy, like all that stuff. He just sort of has rejected. I don't know if he still has. Um, hmm. and, and like, and then he was like re-promoted to, he did like these SNL, uh, skits recently. So obviously all that controversy in his social media really caught fire. Uh, I don't know if that's for it, but, um, it, it trended. So, yeah. but I, 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 he's a real genuine guy. You know, I don't think he intentionally did that. To yeah. his career. He just No. Yeah. I don't. Yeah. I, I wouldn't imagine. Cause he's so, he's like, so 
I mean, he's so he's famous to put, it on, to put it. Yeah, but I mean, yeah. he doesn't like have, and he doesn't have anything to prove. It doesn't seem like like he's. He shouldn't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. I did not know any of that about Jim Carrey. Of course, I mentioned him, and I like I don't keep up to date on on many things. That's really interesting. I, I don't either. He just popped up in my feed, maybe because I just used to really enjoy. Uh, his, yeah. His old... It's interesting the information that we're we're served to because of you know whatever algorithm we yeah it is signed up for <laughs> unconsciously <laughs> yeah yeah and, and on that topic of algorithms like i just because we were mentioning jim carrey like i'm i like to see that it, it was a little bit it was relieving to see that um he wasn't just preaching to the choir there there were comments that were pro and con mm. there were both both perspectives on uh on his like hyper partisan uh statements but how did his how do how do his statements about the industry i guess have to do with politics do you remember or um so i'm trying to, I'm trying to remember exactly but um does it have to do with like social <laughs> issues being represented in media now or social issues i guess uh well he, he was very he's very uh i guess progressive and and he was he was posting a lot of like very pro democrat posts which obviously agrees with the left but then that's oh, half the country that, right. that loves him and watched his movie and were infu infuriated by that oh gotcha um, okay so i don't like to get involved with politics but that I, seems like something the media would support because that's that should be your position in hollywood like quotes right yeah the media that hollywood tends to be more to the left um with some exceptions yeah that's yeah. true interesting okay so yeah. maybe he just went he went too far in in his uh, expression, I don't know. He was just really, he was just really angry and just expressing himself. He was doing what Elon Musk does every day, you know, just kind of. And that's exactly who popped into my head when you start talking about them. Like, oh, is he like Elon Musk? <laughs> <laughs> I'll buy Twitter. No, I changed my mind. I'll buy Twitter. I know. Oh, I'll well, my mind. And, and like, anytime I ask my brother about him, I'm like, so do you know of like any stocks I should be investing in now or whatever? And he's like, I love Tesla. I'm like, oh my God, I'm so not like, I can't, I just can't do it. Like I'm, it's an amazing company. I love what he's doing with the place, but like, I can't buy Elon Musk. He's a, he's a loose cannon. <laughs> like he could, he could decide to like invent, you know, turn his whole company into like a chocolate factory tomorrow. <laughs> you know, like. He is, I mean, fascinating guy. Yeah. I mean, I could, we could spend a few episodes. <laughs> I don't know that much about him, honestly, but just from what I've observed, I'm like, oh, that's just not, that's not a steady, like, that's not a steady stock there. Not financial advice, everyone, <laughs> but like. Yeah, well, Tesla is a, it's a, like a blue chip, you know, it's like among, it's like among the top 10. Yeah, no, it's definitely doing well. But, but that's, but that's sort of like, at that point, it's sort of like, the, in my opinion, like the, the ship has sailed and it's like, okay, you should have gone in, you know, 10 years ago. Yeah, no, that's a good point too, stayed. for sure. That would have been, opinion. that would have been a smart, yeah, it's that would have been a smart idea. But I mean, how could you have known too? It's like, man, I met some crazy dude who said he's gonna make cars out of, you know, whatever. <laughs> you know, you know, the answer to that question is by knowing the right people and yeah. the venture capitalists right, that have right. behind the scenes info. Right. And the people that were investing like millions of dollars, like those are the people that initially I'm saying in these companies, yeah. like those are the ones that are hooked up. Like they're not talking to little people. No, yeah. Like, so you're saying we should become senators and then we'll. And then yeah, we'll, well, we'll we'll or multimillionaires. Those are the yeah. guys that are to, yeah. to do the, uh, the initial uh, venture stages. Yeah, that's true. The angel investment stages. Yeah, yeah. It's true. I mean, it's it's interesting. It's like, how did you know this was going to be a great success? Because so and so poured three billion dollars. Like I knew this person was going to pour three billion dollars. Not like this is an amazing idea. I know. I knew the money was coming. Right. I knew that. Yeah. Well, it's like if somebody's pouring three billion, they're putting their heart and soul into it, and they've yeah. clearly done research. But it's right. like that's true. Yeah. You know, like they're not telling like they're telling their immediate circle, hey, I'm about to put three billion. Yeah. And they're not telling the general public right. necessarily. Right. And then they all like right off of that wave and it's like right. then the stock skyrockets like with uh yeah. you know different cryptocurrencies for instance right. and they all become gajillionaires and then it's like everybody else right well i was gonna say that time. though that's what's actually cool about 
blockchain though is that somebody can't put three billion dollars into something without everybody knowing that's true but these whales uh i think they're like unidentified like it is decentralized but i think it's you don't yeah that's true you don't know who it is but you know the money went there right so it's like somebody's interested there was a log you know yeah i i mean i i definitely like the idea and they're they're building new platforms around the decentralization like storage of, of data like uh, i believe alternatives to google mm. um, which uh i have to be careful what i say i, I like when i use the word <laughs> google because like the algorithm hears all <laughs> but i i like i like the idea that decent i think i think decentralization is emerged out of sheer frustration that just a few major players are running the show yeah it's yeah has not and it's i don't know i guess it it never seems more obvious but it's it's always obvious in some ways i suppose what what's going on behind the scenes but yeah it's like it's obvious but it's not <laughs> Yeah, a lot, yeah. Of, a lot of smoke and mirrors. Going. It's accepted. It's like you get used to it. You know, it's like how I thought people were going to just get used to like COVID yeah. for the rest of our life. I don't know. I was really expecting that, but that didn't happen. Thankfully, I, I was too. Actually, the way yeah. they were talking about it. Yeah, we, you know, we're going to leave our home for like a number of months, and it's like, okay, we're not getting help from the government. We're not getting <laughs> the FDA loan approved, and that's a three percent interest once it actually hits the bank account. Um, so, what are we supposed to do? Like yeah. I'm sitting home, our bank account is depleting. The music industry is kaput. Like all the celebrities that I know are like, they, their tours are canceled, which yeah. subsequently like two, two years afterwards were canceled also, which is like mind blowing if you think about it. Yeah. Uh, and it's like, okay, it's time to take things into my own hands. Like I can't <laughs> just like accept this. Yeah. Yeah. It was. That was fun. <laughs> that was a real coaster. <laughs> and we had a brand new, we had a new newborn. Wow. Wow. So you had a COVID baby? Did you? Yeah, COVID baby. Wow. Oh man, the regulations around that were just like. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, that I was can't... the worst experience you could possibly imagine. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, I was, I did home birth for my first and ended up at a hospital. My second one I, I did at, at, at home, but yeah, I would not. Getting out of hospital regulations for birthing was high priority for me in the uh, normal the normal setting but like yeah i can only imagine with covid i mean were you even able were you able to be in the room with your wife so with my first son well i said it was probably covid because we was in manhattan i wasn't able to be in the room with my son which is like still in retrospect blows my mind like, like because outside. that was their law because um, I think you have to pay like $900 to, and this was like, again, 10 years ago. So inflation factoring in the like 12, 1300 now uh, to get a room where you can actually sleep in the same room. If you're up in like Muncie or like Northern Westchester or something, then no problem. But in Manhattan, they don't do that. But like Charging while she money. was birthing, you weren't able to be in the room? Oh, or? sorry. While she was birthing, I was able to be there. But, oh, okay. But, okay. And then once the, once, Once gotcha. she gave birth, we took the baby away. And I, even when we were like sort of, oh, uh, like she was breastfeeding, <laughs> she was breastfeeding. Uh, I couldn't, I, I couldn't sleep over the night to help oh, her out. I took her to gotcha. the hotel across the street. But my daughter, who was born in, uh, during COVID, um, uh, I, they allowed me to sleep in a chair. Uh, <laughs> and I was in Long Island. And, but, I wasn't, I, I got like one hour of sleep and, and the nurse kept coming in every, like to, kept waking us up, um, like every hour or so it was, so it was like torture chamber because wow. they had to keep taking and checking your blood pressure. I'd keep getting up and just, we were both losing our minds. And at, at a point we just, we had it. We said by two in the morning, we're like, there's no nurses in the room. Stop visiting us. Yeah. We're, we're we need to recover. We need to sleep. I have to take care of my wife, blah, blah, blah. And they sort of complied for a few hours. Wow, really? That's crazy. And that had to do with COVID that they were doing that many checks? Um, I believe, I, well, I'm trying to, it's a little bit of a blur, but uh, it was, I think there were, there were, was it regulations around COVID? I mean, if that she was, that was when it happened. Um, or just like normal, normal birth stuff. I don't know. Well, that would have happened actually prior to COVID. Um, 
yeah, they, they would have, I mean, nurses need to check, check the, uh, your different vitals. Right. Uh, that seems regularly. excessive. That seems it was pretty excessive. And then the fact that like, we couldn't sleep while the baby was with us was also excessive. Wow. And there should have been some sort of accommodations made. There are a bunch of issues. I, I don't want to like, yeah. Um, I feel like I should have brought my <laughs> wife on this podcast because she got <laughs> plenty to say. She, we, we, could, that I want. we could do another one. We could do another one. <laughs> oh, I love that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you the, have a lot to share. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's really excessive. We, we, um, so I was very much involved in my community slash cult at the time. And we had this practice where for 40 days after the birth, you're not supposed to leave your house. And in that community, you home birthed. So we ended up at the hospital, not like it was illegal to end up at a hospital, but that just wasn't sort of like in the plan. So my husband at the time um, decided, told them, they're like, this is what we do. You need to leave us alone. <laughs> So basically they were, they had like a note on the door that said like any nurses that were to come in the room had to check with the head nurse first. And I don't think we I think for that reason, we didn't get, I think there's a lot you can get away with when you say religious, like for religious reasons, nobody wants a lawsuit. I know. Right. Yeah. So, <laughs> so if you're like, sorry, my religion does not allow this many nurse checks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'll keep that in mind for, uh, we're done. <laughs> for my that's the children. thing. I feel like that's why these sorts of things don't change. People don't have like seven. They're not, after you have your last kid, you're like not invested in changing that system. I mean, you know, sadly not next woman's um, problem, you know? I, yeah. I feel like <laughs> you're right. Like I, I would like to, I just, I'm like too overwhelmed with my own life. I mean, I, I love my life, but it's, yeah. it's a lot it's a lot with the family and then, and then like this music career is just like I'm working all the time. So are you producing stuff now? Is that something you yeah. are kind of on a revolving? Yeah. And, and just because I mentioned like the working all the time, I, I, you know, those, the list, those listeners who are not musicians or don't do this for a living. Um, it, it's having, having had like a normal day job for a number of years and like all these other careers. Um, I, I didn't, think that I was a little bit naive. I was thinking that, you know, okay, music would be kind of like a walk in the park, um, being an independent musician. And it wouldn't be quite like a regular day job, but it, it is. I mean, the difference for me and why I really chose it because it's really rewarding. Uh, and, and I just, so is nursing, so is education. Uh, but for me, um, I, 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 like, I kind of jump out of bed every day, um, and I really like, I push I, the, the drive is within as opposed to like, you know, a, a manager telling me, you got, you know, these are my expectations over the semester. Um, here, it's like my brain telling me, these are my ex expectations for you after, you know, over the next month and couple of months. And so to answer your question, uh, I'm producing music like, you know, daily, first of all, but the actual like, curated like mixed and mastered music that I release the singles are uh, just about every month I try to do it sometimes twice a month okay and are you mostly producing your own music a mix uh because producing your own music is a bit expensive uh, you know you, it's for it to be successful to, to launch you either have to collaborate with expensive artists. like financially or time wise both uh both uh producing the music takes more time Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it's more expensive in terms of like just fundraising on fans. And if you're bringing in other elements or other music, other musicians to, uh, to contribute to, to the single release, it's, uh, it's, it's more complicated. There's a lot more back and forth and, and they have to get paid so on and so forth. I try to kind of scale down in some cases, uh, the orchestration, but you know, you, you it's something you're, you live with for, for the rest of your life. And these are ca my catalogs, you know, my kids are going to see this. Our, mm -hmm. My family are hopefully going to listen to this for many more decades. Um, so, so it matters a lot uh, yeah. to me. It's on Spotify, iTunes, like it's representative of the work that I do. It's like writing a book for an author. So totally. So did, I don't, did I answer your question? Yeah, no, I was, that was an interesting, that was interesting that you 
specifically said it was expensive because I guess I've always considered producing my own music, which I don't do, um, to be a cheaper option because I always have to pay someone to produce my music. So you can <laughs> or engineer it at least. Well, yeah, I mean, I I, I do a little bit of both. Uh, so I, I like I do the midis and I do obviously like the violin in the studio. Yeah. Um, which is like the main thing. That's cool. but. But, you know, you could make it simple if you just kind of use, like, pre-made tracks or something. But, like, yeah. I don't know. I, like, I, I, I work hard to, to produce, like, well-orchestrated songs. Yeah, well, especially if you're dealing with real instruments and... and, and yeah, I mean, even, even maybe it's just, like, I, just getting... Like, I, I don't like all the... There's, like, a lot of cheesy music out there. I try not to be a part of it. It's, it's a little harder <laughs> than, as an instrumentalist because I'm, I'm playing pop contemporary i'm not playing classical which is way less cheesier and i'm trying to like cater right. the music to. i mean i feel like i should be asking you about what what you do in, in music because you know i don't know if i'm speaking to another violinist or oh no i'm a singer mostly singer oh. i play keyboard um cool. yeah i've pro i have produced music but i haven't engineered it so it's always been in collaboration with an engineer oh. um and I mean, that's expensive. Working very with expensive. Idea. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm saying like, if I knew how to, do, I, I have been, I have been oh, considering you know, actually yourself. like going to school so that I can just, or do taking yourself. some course or whatever, because that would, that would interest me to know about that. I'm not extremely like, um, uh, versatile sciency. No, like, you know, like in the sense of like, I like when when I hear engineers talk about music, they're like, oh, it's a little tinny over in however many hertz. And I'm like, oh, I'm just like, that's not the way I think about music. <laughs> yeah. But uh, so it, that would be interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's something actually that that I, I share with you, um, like a, a desire to to be more proficient at the mixing, mastering, producing stuff. Uh, but there's some guys out there that are just like do it way better than me. and just easier to just hire them yeah and that's why i have to mix it up to kind of reduce the costs yeah and yeah. also the time very very time consuming that's the thing too i guess you have to kind of decide that's the hard part about becoming an adult is you like have to decide where your priorities are you know you don't have time to be a painter and a dancer and a roller skate artist and, you know. yeah I, I, well, I, can't, I, I kind of wish somebody could just kind of show me the way <laughs> <laughs> yeah so, um, then life would be boring. Yeah, that's true. No, I mean, then no one's, you know, nobody's done your life. For, you know, like, how would they know what your next move is anyway? Yeah, yeah that's true. Yeah. I guess, I guess that's where a mentor can, can come in handy. I find that very helpful. Yeah. If the mentor is useful, unless, it, you know, there's, there's, I've tried a, a number of mentors, like, again, like through courses, and I've just, right, like, right. Oh God, like you're just <laughs> selling me a course, like give me some right. useful information. Yeah, that's funny. I was just talking about that to the woman that I'm actually, that is mentoring me right now. Um, it's not for music specifically, but just like in life. And she was talking about that because I'm, that's something that I also do is I also coach. And we were talking about how like, you know, offering yourself up authentically, like the difference between that and when someone feels like you're trying to sell them something or like push them into something and that icky feeling that you get, you know? Yeah. 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 Well, you know, again, there are good courses and there are not as many good courses. And I think there are far, far more not so good courses There's from so what many I've courses. experienced. Yeah. 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 So I feel like when you find that person that you want to like, you're like, I want to know more. I want to know more about this then that's that's good but it doesn't happen all very often having said that um i i, I feel like i want to be a mentor um <laughs> short order like i but i want to do it the right way like i really like i want to i want to help some other artists really like move their career in a meaningful way yeah once i like once i've really like achieved what i intend to achieve yeah so. I mean, you know, you probably have something to teach now, though, because you're definitely ahead of where you I, were I, 15 years ago or 10 years ago I, or five years ago. I do. Uh, and I could probably pretty easily sell a course um, because I have 20 years of professional like musician, like full time career experience. But I, I, I don't want to 
distract myself from one from my main mission, which is the music. Mm-hmm. And I think that if I'm doing courses, um, it, it's it's going to slow me down. Um, even though I know some successful musicians who who do both, I don't know how they wear both hats. Yeah. Um, one in particular that I know of has her husband actually run the education end mm. of her course while she oh, does gotcha. her music. Yeah. It really it's, it's a full time job. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, there's always the automated route, route too. You're right. You know. You're right. Um, there is the automated route. Um, I don't know if it's a, as impactful, but maybe I'm wrong. Um, you're right. There's there is the automated route. Um, I, you know, for for me, uh, and I had intended to do something like that. I feel like I want to make it a completely comprehensive course with like a lot of the nitty gritty details that I hadn't seen in other courses yeah. that represent my own experience uh, that I feel are really important for uh, uh, aspiring musicians to to learn. Totally. Um, so I don't know. That, I guess that's why I'm waiting. It's a lot. I mean, it's a it's a work. It's like you were talking about writing a book. Like that's that's not something you go. I'm doing it, and then tomorrow it'll be done. You know, like yeah, it's, you it's a process. <laughs> yeah. But you have to start. Yeah, hopefully soon. If you want it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Everybody's doing courses now, even celebrities. I know. Yeah. I mean, what an amazing opportunity, though. Like. When I was little, I I would have totally been down to like learn vocal techniques from Sarah McLaughlin. Like that would have been my dream, you know. Yeah. yeah. Um, for sure, it's pretty cool. Um, I, I'm still looking for that course that fits my needs. Uh, haven't seen it yet. Ooh, that's the one you make. Yeah, I guess so. I, I think that's <laughs> kind of what's going to happen. I, I mean, again, I, like meeting like meeting somebody. And, and hiring them as a, as a mentor, um, who, somebody who's further ahead in their career than you, it's probably a better idea if they're really genuine, but it costs an arm and a leg probably. And then you have to mm-hmm. actually get to know them. Depends. I mean, it depends on how much they value what they're giving, honestly. Like you could find something really great that's not as expensive. You can find something really lame that's super expensive. I mean, just all yeah. really depends 100%. on what somebody what somebody's rated. I mean, it's, it's so, yeah, that, that, that was another thing we were talking about. It was just how imaginary the whole money thing is. Like <laughs> I cost yeah. $500. I cost $5,000. I cost $50,000. <laughs> yeah. I guess supply and demand somehow. Yeah. But I mean, some of the, some of the most like disingenuous courses that are outside the music industry uh, that I've seen. Um, and I, I didn't take, but the reviews were horrendous. Mm. The, Google, YouTube, Facebook, they keep showing me their ads and I'm like, and they micro control everything. They have data on everything. And I, I'm wondering, it's like, I feel like calling up the CEO if, and, and asking them, why are you, why do you keep showing me this like scammer of, of like a, an entrepreneur guy who just like rips people up, like ca- charges people three grand and teaches them nothing. Like, look at the reviews online. Does that inform you at all about how, yeah. how, who you should be showing these ads to? <laughs> it's weird because they pretend to be so like, they pretend to be so caring about spreading misinformation, yeah. right? <laughs> and yeah. then they're like, but they'll look, but if you're paying them and it's like something that I guess they can get away with, which they obviously can, then they're yeah. pretty much willing to run any ad. Yeah. Yeah. I guess, I guess there's, there's no, uh, uh, there's no filter there. Yeah. I always think it's funny when you see the thing come up on YouTube, that's like, help out YouTube by telling us what your age demographic is. And I'm like, help you out so you can, so you can send me ads like what's Talk in this for, for me <laughs> help us help us on patreon yeah <laughs> help support our for-profit business <laughs> yeah, small entrepreneur company we are independent uh programmers who right. uh, affect change in the world please buy us a cup of coffee right <laughs> That's great. Uh, well, Asher, thank you so much for, for doing this. Would you like to share with people how they can learn more about you, stay in touch with you? And yeah. and I will add those links to the podcast description notes so that they're clickable. Sure. This is my baby. Um, okay. And you can check me out on astrolab.com. You hear me, uh, hear a lot of the music that I produce on this. And um, Instagram, TikTok, the Facebook, what else? Twitter. 
Uh, but ashlab.com is the main thing. You can see all my new releases and then you can check me out on like Spotify, Deezer, the, the links are all, all there. And I welcome you to, to share the music with your friends. Add it to playlist. Please do it. It, it, <laughs> it, helps, me, it helps me significantly and, and it really means a lot. And I connect with everybody on, on Instagram and Facebook. So come, cool. come by, stop by and say hello. What's your handle on Instagram? Asher Lobb, A-S-H-E-R-L-A-U-B. That's easy. And Facebook is, yep. And Facebook is Asher Lobb Music. Okay, I will add this. Cool. All right, well, thank you so much. Have a great day and enjoy the rest of your summer. Thanks, great chatting with you. <laughs>